love live music. I love to go to live music concerts and be in the front row and interact with the the artist. And that's that's yeah. my happy place. Like if somebody asked me where my happy place was, it would be in the front row at any concert. Um, <laughs> right so, on. yeah, so uh, we have a big festival in New Orleans called Jazz Fest every year. And it's a seven day festival over two weekends. And there's, na- you know, there's local musicians and then there's huge names that come. And one year, I think four years ago, uh, Rod Stewart was one of the big names. And my, you know, I, I grew up listening to Rod Stewart because my parents listened to him a lot, but I didn't like really know his music. I mean, I knew the big ones, you know, I knew like Maggie May and, you know, the big, yeah. the big ones, but yeah. I didn't really know, you know. Um, and my friend and I really wanted to see him though. And so we camped out all day for a spot because that's what you do at Jazz Fest. And, <laughs> yeah. um, I got the second worst sunburn of my life that day. But, but, um, but anyway, when he came on, he kept looking at us and he kept singing to me. And I mean, I'm like trying to think that I know the lyrics, right? Because I don't know the lyrics to most of these songs <laughs> at this point. And so um, by the end, he looked at me and he goes, do you want to come backstage? And I was like, okay. So he has security take us, my friend and I, backstage. And his uh, one of his backup singers was uh, moving on to Broadway after that show. And so they were having a party for her. There was cake and wine. I mean, he's like, you know, do you want some wine? You want some cake, you know? And so we started talking. And I mean, it's Rod Stewart. Like, we're sitting there talking yeah. to him after his show. Yep. He's just walking around barefoot in his white linen, comfortable clothes. And, like, it's crazy. And um, and so my friend was like, you know, Catherine's a graphic designer. And she loves to design for the music industry, which is true. That's my favorite industry to design for. <clears throat> and he, and she, you know, jokingly says, if you ever need something, ha ha, look her up. And he goes, well, mm. actually, I have an album coming out in, I think it was September at the time. Do you want to try to work on some album art for me? I haven't picked it yet. And I'm like, okay sure or rod stewart like okay so he <laughs> um hooked us up with his manager and she said yeah i'll send you the specs on tuesday and you know we hung out a little longer and we left and i'm thinking like this isn't gonna happen like i'm not gonna hear from this woman you know i mean why would i hear from this woman but i did and she sent me the specs i worked with her well i worked with him through her over like a three month period. And um, I would send him some ideas and he would send me feedback and we'd go back and forth. And um, yeah, I, I did not, it, apparently from what I understand, it came down to two designs. One was mine, one was somebody else's and he went with somebody else's. But the two designs were like total opposites. Like they, they were nothing alike. So he just, you know, he went with that direction. But um, I mean, he still paid me for my work and I yeah. got to work with him, you know, and, and we're actually seeing him this weekend um, <clears throat> because I still keep in touch through his manager, That's which cool. is amazing, you know? Yes, um, yes. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's really cool. And that was by far the highest profile person I've ever worked with. Um, and it was like a one-time, you know, situation. But I loved it. I mean, I loved working with him. He... To overcome, you must educate. Educate not only yourself, but educate anyone seeking to learn. We are all dead America. We can all learn something. To learn, we must challenge what we already understand. The way we do that is through conversation. Sometimes we have conversations with others. However, 
Some of the best conversations happen with ourselves. Reach out and challenge yourself. Let's dive in and learn something right now. Today we are speaking with Catherine Clematis. She is an artist and a designer, and some of the work that she does is fabulous. Catherine, could you please introduce yourself and let people know just a little more about you, please? Sure. Uh, so I am an artist and a graphic designer. Um, I started painting when I was about five, and I sold my first painting when I was 10. Um, one thing that's a little bit different about me is that I have a genetic bone disease called osteogenesis imperfecta, which um, is more easily known as brittle bone disease. Um, but basically it means that my bones break easily and they grow abnormally. So I am actually only two foot seven and I use an electric wheelchair for mobility and I have an aid with me almost all the time. So I can't do a lot of my daily activities by myself, like uh, getting food or going to the bathroom or running my business. I, I need help doing a lot of those things. Um, I grew up with two parents who were veterinarians. So animals have always been a huge part of my life. Um, I mean, I literally grew up in a vet's office. So, <laughs> so I've seen a lot of animals. Um, and when I was young, you know, I went to a mainstream school my entire life. Uh, and so there were a lot of activities I couldn't do that my friends could do. And so, of course, you know, I was bored and I was smart <laughs> and I was driving my mom completely crazy because I was bored. <laughs> and, uh, and so when I was five, she gave me my first watercolor set. Um, she was constantly trying to come up with things I could do, you know, to keep me occupied but um, she gave me that first watercolor set when I was five, and I got totally hooked on it. And my parents quickly realized that art was something I could do, which was great because it kept me occupied. But it was also something I really liked and something I was actually okay at, even at five. Um, <laughs> so they got me into lots of classes. I, of course, I took classes in school, but then also I took... Um, private lessons with uh, several teachers and then I uh summer camps you know every summer camp I could get into I got to try all different kinds of media by the time I was a teenager um and then I eventually went into graphic design in college so today I own my own art and design business um on the art side I do mostly well pretty much all watercolor and all animals so um, you know, the growing up with veterinarians really uh, stayed with me. So I do a lot of pet portraits and things like that. And then on the graphic design side, I do a lot of branding design. So business cards and logos and letterhead and websites, social media management, things like that. Wow, that's the gamut. Yeah. That, that's, <laughs> that, that's tremendous. You know, and... I, I kind of feel ashamed because I, I cried a little bit when I got injured and, you know, I, I'm <sighs> disabled myself and I find myself with a bunch of broken bones and the chronic pain that I deal with. I can't imagine what you're going through. And <laughs> I, I, I really find, you know, comfort knowing that I'm not the only one going through that sort of stuff. Oh yeah, and of course. You've not. you've had to deal with this all your life though. What what was it like early on going to school? You, you said you go to public school and that that must have been something, huh? Well, I went to a private grade school and then I went to a public high mm. school. Um so okay. you know, those years where I was really growing up, I was in a really great private grade school that was small and very family oriented um, and very accommodating. Awesome. So, you know, that was, that was good. also very expensive, but, but you know, <laughs> um, but it was great because, you know, they made sure that, 
you know, with my parents pushing them to make sure, but they made sure that I had everything I needed and all the accommodations I needed. And that they, you know, they were basically forced to make an effort to include me in everything they possibly could, you know, and, and they did. I mean, they were, they were great. You know, the headmaster was wonderful and all the teachers were wonderful and, um, you know, it was a great place to grow up. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, people asked me a lot if I was bullied. Um, and, you know, I guess because I did go to such a good school that took bullying of any kind very seriously, um, I really wasn't. I mean, yeah, there were certainly, awesome. you know, there were certainly cliques and, you know, girls can be really mean when they're growing up, <laughs> especially as teenagers. And yeah, I mean, I'm sure, you know, I was picked on and I'm sure there were days where I came home crying because somebody was mean to me or whatever, but no more than yeah. a regular teenage girl, you know, no, no more than That's all awesome. my other friends. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was good. And then the public school I went to, went to for high school was a, basically a magnet school. I mean, it was the, <laughs> they, the, when you, when you say in New Orleans that you went to Ben Franklin for high school, that's like, oh, you went to the smart kid school. I mean, like, that's just, <laughs> like, you're automatically branded a nerd, you know, because you went to Ben Franklin. And um, and it is, it's the, you know, it's got very high level classes and you're there because you plan to go to college and it's a college prep school and you work really hard. Um, and that's, you know, and I always loved school. So that was not a problem for me. Um yeah. Yeah, I I always joke that until my probably my the end of my junior year of college, I worked much harder in high school than I did in college up until that oh. point. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so so what was some of the major issues you had to deal with with your mobility and needing an assistant and you know what what some of the functionality uh discomforts well one of the one of the biggest ones was just making sure i was safe you know without like yeah. without wrapping me in bubble wrap you know um because there's a balance right i mean you know when i was young before i hit puberty i could turn wrong and break a bone you know it took nothing it took wow. somebody breathing on me wrong you know and so and this is something my parents had to deal with probably more than I did originally, but it's that balance. Like, where do you draw the line of, you know, okay, do we let her go out and do this and know that she might break something or do we keep her in and shelter her? And, you know, she might break something anyway because she sneezes, you know? Yeah. And so my parents always tried to make sure I got out and did as much as I could and as much um, but of course, within reason, you know, but as much as my friends were doing too. And, and some of how we dealt with that was when my friends were old enough, you know, when they were nine, 10, you know, they started learning how to move me around too. And they started learning how to pick me up. And it was, it was cool. You know, they thought it was cool that they got to do something an adult did. And so, you know, then we could start as teenagers we could start being dropped off at the mall by ourselves, you know, and I didn't have to have a parent yeah. with me um, because that was also a major challenge was having an adult standing next to me as a kid all the time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, no kid wants that disaster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, especially as a teenager, you know, it gets, it gets awkward, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know? And well, so, I mean, we worked with that where like they would at least, set me up with my books and then leave the classroom. You know, I mean, we would, we yeah. would work with that, but um, yeah, that was definitely a challenge. So, it sounds like you had an awesome support system with your parents, your friends. Definitely. So getting in that right frame of mind with the right people is always important in life. Oh yeah. You know, I, I was going through some of your, fascinating work this is watercolor how i thought watercolor went everywhere when you 
kind of <laughs> painted. But you've got like paint in the box, stay in the line type paintings <laughs> here that you can't tell that this is watercolor. Yeah. Talk about that. Well, um, yeah, I developed this system. I mean, look, watercolor can do a lot more than people give it credit for. Um, I, I think it gets a bad rap sometimes because exactly what you just said. You know, most people think that it's all flowy and you put a bunch of water and then the paint goes everywhere. And that is yeah. one way to do it. I mean, that is one very legitimate way to paint with watercolor. Or you can do what I do. And you can get a brush with like three hairs on it and you can layer it, which is, which is what I do. Um, I wow. use, I, I kind of cheat a little bit because I use white and very traditional watercolorists don't use white. They, they, the technique is that you leave the paper white where you want to have white. Um, and that's the, the most, most traditional sense of watercolor uh, possible. Um, very few people actually do that now, though, uh, because there are so many options for white. But, um, but yeah, I, I use white, and I have a really small brush, and I go through about, I would say, a brush every maybe three paintings. I can usually make them wow. last about three. Yeah, and then they die. <laughs> So, oh. so are these special brushes or no, do you just very make small. them yourself? No, 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 huh. no, no, I, I have Amazon <laughs> for that. No, 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 I, um, no, I, and you know, like I, it's funny because, uh, when, uh, what is it? Black Friday came, you know, last year, everybody's like, Oh, what are you buying on black Friday? And you know, are you getting a TV or are you getting a computer? I'm like, no, I'm buying like 40 paint brushes because <laughs> they're on like 70% off sale right now, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah, exactly that's... what I did. Was yeah. I bought like 40 paint brushes. Because when you're an artist and you're a professional artist and you're trying to put you're trying to put work out in a time frame and you find the technique that works for you, you just have to find a way to repeat it. And so like if this company stops making this brush, I'm going to be very upset. So I make sure I make sure I have lots and lots of them on hand. You know? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so how long does it take for you to accomplish <laughs> one of these paintings? Well, it depends on what it is, and it depends on the size. Um, I have a rule that I don't do anything bigger than myself anymore. <laughs> I have done that. <laughs> I've done that a few times, and it's rewarding in the end but not that rewarding so it's you know it's really not really worth it to me to do that um so generally like if you were to commission a pet portrait i do nine by 12 is my biggest and then it goes down from there so there's eight by ten and five by seven um but the nine by 12s usually take me four or five days something like that i would say uh -huh. Yeah. That quick, um, huh? Yeah, the five by sevens I can usually get out in two days. Sometimes three. Depends wow. on the depends on the animal and the complexity of it. But like I just did my own dog and she has a um she has a brendel face, which means that her face is like black and brown mixed together. And she was very difficult. She took three days. <laughs> but oh, anyway, wow. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you you would think it took a lot longer than a few days. It used to, so, but yeah. you know when you do it constantly, you get faster. Right. You know. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That that's the trick. You you keep doing it, and you get better and better. That's the trick. You know, yeah. everything you do, it, you practice, and you get better. You get quicker. And, exactly. and you find those shortcuts. Yes. So yeah, that that's the important thing. So, yes. what 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 would you tell an inspiring artist? How would you have them get started in doing what you do? Well, I actually just had a young lady. I think she said she was about fourteen. Email me the other day and say that she was given my book as a gift and. 
um, and asked me that exact question uh, because she also wants to be an artist. And honestly, awesome. it's take as many classes as you can and learn as much as you can, as fast as you can and practice as, as all the time. I mean, always practice. Um, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm doing this as a profession, so I don't get to learn as much as I would like to anymore. You know, I would, I would love yeah. to have time to go take some classes and, you know, do something different than what I do every day. And, you know, maybe after catching up after the shutdown and COVID and all that, you know, maybe once that yeah. kind of clears out and, you know, um, financially things get a little more stable, uh, I'll be able to do that. But, um, yeah, you know, when you're a kid and your parents, if they're willing to put you in classes, I mean, do it, even if you don't like it, because you're going to learn something yeah. like, you know, I took um, private lessons with a college professor in high school. And so this lady taught me on a college level in high school, like as a 13 year old. And yeah. it was really hard. And it was, I mean, it was things like draw 18 circles without a compass and draw, you know, fill this piece of paper with a bunch of straight lines and you don't get a ruler. You know, it, wow. and it was, you know, two hours of that on a weekend when I could be out with my friends, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and so, Sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it was um, kind of obnoxious, but... I learned a ton from her. I mean, she's yeah. probably my most influential mentor, you know, that I've ever had and, and the person that really taught me how to draw. And so you're not always going to like it, but you're going to learn a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. So <laughs> you've commissioned some great work for some high profile people. Talk to us about that and how did it feel? So, yeah, so I'm sure you're talking about Rod Stewart. Um, so of course I, I am. <laughs> of course you are. So I, um, I love live music. I love to go to live music concerts and be in the front row and interact with the, the artists. And that's, that's yeah. my happy place. Like if somebody asked me where my happy place was, it would be in the front row at any concert. Um, <laughs> right so, on. yeah, so, uh, we have a big festival in New Orleans called Jazz Fest every year, and it's a seven day festival over two weekends. And there's, you know, there's local musicians, and then there's huge names that come. And one year, I think four years ago, uh, Rod Stewart was one of the big names. And my, you know, I, I grew up listening to Rod Stewart because my parents listened to him a lot but I didn't like really know his music I mean I knew the big ones you know I knew like Maggie May and you know the big yeah. the big ones yeah. but I didn't really know you know um and my friend and I really wanted to see him though and so we camped out all day for a spot because that's what you do at Jazz Fest and <laughs> yeah. um I got the second worst sunburn of my life that day but <laughs> but um but anyway when he came on he kept looking at us and he kept singing to me. And I mean, I'm like trying to think that I know the lyrics, right? Because I don't know the lyrics to most of these songs <laughs> at this point. And so um, by the end, he looks at me and he goes, do you want to come backstage? And I was like, okay. So he has security take us, my friend and I backstage and his uh, one of his backup singers was uh, moving on to Broadway after that show. And so they were having a party for her. There was cake and wine. I mean, he's like, you know, do you want some wine? Do you want some cake? You know, and so we started talking. And I mean, it's Rod Stewart. Like, we're sitting there talking yeah. to him after his show. Yep. He's just walking around barefoot in his white linen, comfortable clothes. And, like, it's crazy. And um. And so my friend was like, you know, Catherine's a graphic designer and she loves to design for the music industry, which is true. That's my favorite industry to design for. <clears throat> and he, and she, you know, jokingly says, if you ever need something, 
ha ha ha, look her up. And he goes, well, mm. actually, I have an album coming out in, I think it was September at the time. Do you want to try to work on some album art for me? I haven't picked it yet. And I'm like, okay, sure. Or Rod Stewart? Like, okay. So he <laughs> um, hooked us up with his manager, and she said, yeah, I'll send you the specs on Tuesday. And, you know, we hung out a little longer and we left. And I'm thinking, like, this isn't going to happen. Like, I'm not going to hear from this woman. You know, I mean, why would I hear from this woman? But I did. And she sent me the specs. I worked with her. Well, I worked with him through her over, like, a three-month period. And um, I would send him some ideas, and he would send me feedback, and we'd go back and forth. And, um, yeah, I, I did not – apparently, from what I understand, it came down to two designs. One was mine, one was somebody else's, and he went with somebody else's. But the two designs were, like, total opposites. Like, they, they were nothing alike. So he just, you know, he went with that direction. But, um, I mean, he still paid me for my work. And I yeah. got to work with him, you know. And, and we're actually seeing him this weekend um, <clears throat> because I still keep in touch through his manager. That's which cool. is amazing, you know. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's really cool. And that was by far the highest profile person I've ever worked with. Um, and it was like a one-time, you know, situation, but I loved it. I mean, I loved working with him. He, he's so funny because he's such a typical artist in that he just, he doesn't know what he wants. Like he knows what he doesn't want. He knows what he doesn't like, but he has (laughs) no idea what he actually really wants. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it was great. Exactly. Exactly. And I think what he chose ultimately for that album is so different than anything he's ever put out. And I think that's what he was looking for, was something just so completely out of the box for him. And so, you know, I'm glad I'm glad he found what he wanted. You know? Well, you're you're blessed to be able to have that opportunity to have yeah. that high profile of an individual point at you. It's yeah. right on. And and I'm so proud that he took the time to do that. Yeah. It's, it's what our world really needs more of. I, yeah. I really enjoy it. So what would a call to action for our listeners be from you? Uh, you know, I, I try to tell people that, or, you know, I have found, let's put it that way, from my experience, that everyone has something they can contribute to society or to their family or to their friends, whatever. Um, And you just have to figure out what it is and then you have to do it. I mean, it's, I know that sounds simple. Obviously it's not all the time, Um, but you know, my something is art. That's what I can do. That's what I can give. And, um, and that's what I try to do, but you know, it doesn't have to be something complicated. Like it doesn't have to be, curing cancer or creating some teleportation device or whatever. I mean, it can just be mentoring a kid or being a good mom or, you know, um, helping a a sick relative, whatever, you know, it it can be anything that's that simple, you know? And I just, I feel like there's a lot of people that just, they, they don't know what they want to do or they just don't feel like putting in the effort and then they just don't do anything. And that's, you know, yeah. that's frustrating. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that that's a good call to action. You know, do it. Get exactly. Out there like and Nike. Do it. Just do it. Yeah, just do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, you, your website covers public speaking your blog, your graphic design. Talk to people about your services, what you offer, and how they can get a hold of you if they would like to commission a portrait or whatever of their pet. Yeah, yeah so I, um, as I mentioned as a child, I got really bored, and I'm sure you can hear my dogs right now. Um, 
I got really bored and that did not change. I still get bored if I do the same thing over and over. So I, I have chosen to go in a lot of different directions. Um, so my biggest, I mean, the biggest thing I do is probably my painting. So I do a lot of pet portraits, but I also do commissioned work of other animals. So I, I live in South Louisiana, so I get a lot of commissions for birds, like Louisiana-based whitewater birds. Um, but if you want to commission a pet portrait, you go on my website, which is kakartnola.com, and you fill out the form, you send me some pictures, you know, you pick your size, um, put down a down payment, and then I get started. Uh, normally, that process, it as far as like a time frame, it kind of depends on how many I have in line at any given time. Um, right now, I only have two. However, the closer it gets to Christmas, the crazier my life gets. So the <laughs> sooner I get, yeah, the sooner I get those in, the better. Um, and then, I, as I mentioned, I graduated in graphic design. So I do um, mostly work for small businesses. So um like logos and business cards. And I manage a lot of Facebook pages and Instagram accounts. Um, and I also work for a few nonprofits. So um, when they have events, I do a lot of the, the promotional materials and then the, you know, banners or whatever they need at the actual event, that kind of thing. Um, so we're doing um invitations and save the dates and all that kind of stuff for them uh, do public speaking also so normally i speak to kind of three different areas um one is uh, mostly about school inclusion which i mean we've talked about a little bit already here but um just the idea of including disabled kids in the mainstream school um another talk i do is usually to medical professionals or medical students um, and that's not just not just doctors I mean like a physical therapist or occupational therapist or rehab specialist more about my disease and my experiences I've had with um, medical professionals which some have been really good and some have not been so uh, yeah. that yeah <laughs> that uh that's a good one. Um, I try to encourage them to think outside the box a little bit, which I don't know that that happens enough in schools, you know, for medical professionals. And then the other with just general motivation, like my story and what I do and my, about my art and um, yeah, kind of all we've covered here today. So yeah. Great. Those are kind of the three things. And then I also design jewelry, which is, it's kind of like, like painting is not a hobby anymore. Painting is a job. <laughs> you know, jewelry <laughs> is kind of a job, but still kind of a hobby because it's not something I necessarily do all year round. I do it more around the holidays because that's when people are wanting it. Um, but, but it's more of a, um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a fine art, you know, it's more of like a, it's not a craft either. It's somewhere in the middle, um, but I do that yeah. as well. And you can find that on my Etsy store. Okay. And uh, could you tell them your website, please? Oh yes. It is dot com, And from there you can get to all of my social media and my Etsy store, but on social media, I'm also Cat Art Nola. So um, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube. I think that might be it. I think, I think that's all I can manage for myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Catherine, it sure is a pleasure having you on the Dead America podcast. Thank and you. I want to say thank you for taking the time to share your story here with us. Yeah, absolutely. This is great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us today. If you found this podcast enlightening, entertaining, educational in any way, please share, like, subscribe, and join us right back here next week for another great episode of Dead America Podcast. I'm Ed Waters, your host. Enjoy your afternoon.
wherever you may be.